great to be here. Let me uh, preface by saying first, uh, there's a number of folks here who are uh, serving in the Department of Defense. My remarks are not intended to influence you in any way. I have two and a half days remaining on an ethics restriction on communication. We only have five, ten more days. Two and a half. <laughs> it's the 17th, right? 12.01 1201 p.m. on the 20th. Uh, so, I am not intending to influence you. Um, so if you need to cover your ears, please do. But uh, the, Henry asked me to, uh, to talk about things like red lines. And I must confess, my first red line is never attend a conference where the lawyers outnumber the others. <laughs> and I, I realized only after the invitation was extended and accepted that this was co-sponsored by the American Bar Association and I was violating the red line. All of the invitations. Yeah. So, uh, but it is a pleasure being here and I mean, there's an advantage to having so many lawyers in the room, they're not suing me currently because they're here. So. I will, uh, I'm going to cheat on my answer to the question because we could speculate a lot about where the red lines are for conduct in space. Um, we talked a little bit about activities there and actually uh, Doug and I, I think, have some differences in opinion on the uh, satellite with no mother problem and that uh, I still believe that if someone uh, sank a American aircraft carrier with no sailors aboard that the, the United States would react strongly. And I think the satellite is an American aircraft carrier. It's a military asset. But um, we don't know that, thankfully, because we haven't reached that point in history yet. But we may reach that point in history. And if we do, we're going to have to work through it. And what I think is the red line that we need to keep in mind is a red line of the mind. It's a red line of misconception. And there's a number of ways that we can arrive in our minds at major misconceptions, which in a moment of crisis will paralyze us, or will lead us to make appallingly bad decisions when faced with that moment of choice. So what I'd like to talk about here is really how the I see, at least in my, in my personal take, the space domain changing and how our mental models may be collapsing in the face of that change. I'm going to give you two simple uh, mental heuristics that I, at least personally, as a, as a comparative neophyte to the space issues, although someone who's been engaged on the edges of them for my whole career, um, I've only recently focused solely on I think there's two heuristics that help to wrap your head around how things are changing. I think that's relevant whether you're a lawyer. You're supposed to be booing and hissing. <laughs> uh, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a technologist, uh, whether you're a military strategist, regardless of the role. So the first is, in space, which is an engineered domain in which humans do not naturally exist, um, Pete and I know you aspire to naturally exist in space, but most of us do not naturally persist in the vacuum. Uh, we only accomplish things when three things come together, in my mind. The first is something is technologically feasible. The second is something is economically viable. And my caveat here is economically viable can mean convincing Congress to fund it or convincing a nation state to invest in a sustained period. But the, and the third is policy permissible. And the reason I say policy permissible is we have a legal and regulatory environment that you know, makes states responsible for actions in space and requires them to have a appropriate framework for handling activities. You know, we, we talk of private space, but we still don't actually have that in a, in a sense of true control. So, Economically viable, technologically feasible, policy acceptable. Simple Venn diagram, you think of you know, three circles, could very easily put it on PowerPoint from the 1990s. Uh, even a view graph back from when uh, Doug was making them on various uh, Air Force roles in uniform. Uh, 
where, not a terribly informative thing until you realize right now all three of those circles on that simple Venn diagram are simultaneously changing in size and position. So we are in an environment right now where technology is moving. Pete passed around a satellite earlier today that uh, you know has a, I guess has a potential to make interstellar voyages. Interstellar voyages. That's not something that I can easily wrap my head around. Um, if those of you who can, I'm, my hat is off to you. We are we are looking at rapid technological pace, and we're looking at technological pace where the impetus for it has has shifted. Right? It's it's not just the traditional sources of technology. So technological possibility is shifting. Economic viability is shifting even more rapidly. Some of it, I mentioned, you know, you can be economically viable if you convince NASA to write you a large check or the Department of Defense if there's an imminent threat that they can respond to only by writing a large contract. Well, we're now also in an environment where you can be economically viable at least for enough time to really make things happen by attracting passion capital from more than a handful of significant investors who are willing to get there. And because in so many areas of human endeavor, there's enormous things that can be accomplished if only someone will give you five years and enough time and enough money, we actually can get over those hurdles in ways that we couldn't historically in space. Opening new doors. Policy permissible, though, is a tricky one. And it's tricky for a lot of reasons. We're in the midst of looking at regulatory environment in a whole host of activities across federal government some of which are long overdue and some of which you know, could create risks down the road. But the fact remains that our mental concepts for grappling with what is permissible in space and how it fits into the structure of how we organize society and things like privacy and things like national security is really still quite archaic. Do we want to grow that circle and increase what is policy permissible? Do we want to move that circle and shift it out of more government control? Those are big questions for society. They're questions that are being forced by some of this passion capital and other you know, exciting opportunities. So that, that's mental model one. And what I would suggest to you is when, as you're grappling with the question of, you know, what kind of what should be in our military manual for uh, law of armed conflict in space or, or law of conduct, the safe conduct in space, think about, OK, we know we have a vague sense of where we are today, but how? What, if, what would the world be like? What would the world be like that we might be in ten and fifteen and twenty years down the road if, if these circles continue to move? But the caveat here, and this is one that many of you, especially if you've worked in finance in any way, have lived very immediately, is our minds have an enormous challenge grappling with change, which is exponential in nature. Right? We naturally assume linear progressions. And uh, where people make billions is where they figure out where the exponentials exist and the rest of us are thinking it's linear. There are some areas of what's going on in space right now which have the potential to put us on that path, right? Global internet from space reaching locations around the world may indeed be there. There's a few other things that are in that category. Uh, maybe, maybe things related to you know, uh, globally available private intelligence of activity in space that enables enormous things. But our minds have trouble with that. And so don't just project those bubbles sliding out and growing linearly. Figure out what areas are not linear. The second mental model for you here is, is really simple. And lots of people have different formulations for it. But it's, again, three big trends that I see going on in space and that are shaping our um, our activity, and what we want to do, and what we can do. And diff again, different people have different words for this. None, none of these ideas are unique to me, uh, nor should they be, because I don't know anything. Uh, the first is we're crowding. Space is enormously big, but we are beginning to crowd in ways that are meaningful. And you're seeing that in the administration's focus on identifying a policy structure for space trans traffic management. Um, you're seeing that in the global discussions on space sustainability. A uh, lot of fascinating technical and economic issues there because, of course, as humanity, we have a long tradition of taking common pool resources of one sort or another and 
screwing them up. Uh, hopefully we can avoid that here because the timelines on space and the cost of remediating things we screw up are really, really high. Uh, so we are we're operating in that environment where we are crowding and it's going to force us again to think in fundamentally different ways about how we organize and structure and how we make trade-offs because otherwise we will be rival. If Elon Musk puts a constellation of thousands of low Earth orbit, orbit satellites in one orbit, it doesn't matter that the Outer Space Treaty says everybody has an equal right to that orbit. Anybody else that wants to go in that orbital regime, in that altitude, it is taking on and imposing risk that is likely to be unacceptable. If you are not, if you do not have the software and the, and the data to do the automatic deconfliction in a shell of thousands of satellites, you are imposing risk on yourself and on everybody else. So the crowding will matter if even 20% or 30% of these planned large LEO constellations come to fruition. The second big piece here is democratization in my term, and lots of people have different terms for that. But what I mean by that is new actors with new value sets creating new pressures. And again, we've got all sorts of interesting things happening right now that are uh, trying to respond and create a structure for that. But if we're thinking, many of us in this room work in national security, if we're thinking about our core missions and what we try to do from a U.S. national security perspective or allied nations, thinking about how the democratization changes fundamental assumptions about how we do our business is absolutely critical. What does it mean if, um, well, we have Hawkeye 360. Here's Mike still here? No. Mike left. Oh, I can make fun of him. Uh, <laughs> if, if we have Hawkeye 360 doing what many people would describe as SIGINT on the private sector from space, what does that mean for our expectations of privacy? I mean, obviously, they have plans that are designed to shield against this. I'm sure they're good. But what does that mean for our expectations of privacy? What does that mean for uh, competitive advantage in the economic market. It's a democratization that is still hard to wrap your head around. What does it mean when high schools are launching CubeSats? And we are getting an entire generation hooked on applications from space at a very early age and may or may not be able to offer productive things for them to do coming out of that. I say high schools. We actually have middle schools launching satellites now, including one in uh, Northern Virginia small Catholic school in Northern Virginia. So democratization is real, and it's countries, it's companies, it's, you know, it's application stuff with non-governmental organizations harnessing freely available data that cost governments billions before. Uh, my, uh, my friend uh, Jeffrey Lewis, who writes on arms control issues, uh, noted you know, he gets 60 centimeter imagery off a of planet free for you know analyzing the North Korean nuclear program as a scholar at a university daily daily um, mind blowing I mean we have people here who you know worked in the intelligence community in years gone by and the concept of having that kind of global revisit uh, is remarkable so democratization and then. The third is the part that we spent a lot of time this morning before I departed, <laughs> thereby uh, impairing my ability to summarize the discussions on the manual. <laughs> uh, but, and that is the contested space issues and this vitally important question of understanding norms of behavior, rules of the road, so that we do not inadvertently cross red lines we didn't have to cross. Deterrence, you know, really hinges on communication. Understanding interests, communicating interests, communicating intent where possible, and building a common intellectual framework. And so in an environment of democratization and contestation, you've got new actors who may have different intellectual frameworks or risk tolerances and a real significant communications problem. So, Many people in this room probably have very specific thoughts about what we can do to enhance the deterrence regime, the deterrence environment in space, and more clearly communicate one to another so that we can prevent conflict. But what we, what we know pretty darn clearly is it is in humanity's interest to avoid major war. We've been pretty lucky in that respect. Uh, you know, 
for the last generation. Um, we want to avoid major war. If, if we unfortunately have major war, it would be nice if it didn't extend to space. And we also hope we don't have conflict in space that turns into major war on the ground. But those are two separate paths that could both end up very badly. And those that are working in U.S. national security have a responsibility to figure out how to protect U.S. interest while preserving, you know, avoiding the enormous damage to both space and humanity that would occur if we miscalculate and allow either a major terrestrial war that may or may not extend to space or a conflict in space to trigger a major terrestrial war, both of which would be you know, enormously bad outcomes for our nation and for humanity. So, Red lines are hard to find. They're even harder to find when you're, all of your core assumptions are being redefined. And so I think one of the nice things about the discussion today is we had a cross-community flow of information, even including lawyers, that allowed us to question some of those core assumptions and grapple through tough problems. That's why I enjoyed the discussion. I hope you all did as well. Thank you.